Has anyone ever, um, good, thank you, Adam. Has anyone ever watched the show Shark Tank? A few of you have seen that. <clears throat> well, if you haven't, the show, it's a, it's a reality show in which these would-be entrepreneurs try to pitch their business ideas to some potential investors. They're called the sharks. And so these excited, hopeful business owners need to convince the sharks that they have a great money-making idea. Now, if one of, or more of the investors agree that it is a good idea, they will make an offer to invest in the idea in exchange for a certain percentage of the profits, <coughs> excuse me, for the, of the profits that are going to come out of that business if it turns out successfully. Now, on the other hand, if the investors don't like the idea of the wannabe business moguls, they, these uh, people are left then with this great idea, but there's nobody to back it up. There's no money, there's no uh, influence, there's no clout or anything like that. If the sharks say, I don't like this idea, we're not going to go that way. And this is somewhat of the situation where David found himself when he proposed that he was going to build a temple for the Lord in Jerusalem. He believed that he had a great idea, but God had a different plan. However, as we will see, the Lord's plan for David was far greater than David's idea of just building a permanent palace for worship. God was going to establish a permanent kingdom over Israel, and in turn, all the nations in the world were going to, to be under the rule of this descendant of David. And so while David had a great idea, he was going to build this temple for the Lord, God had a bigger idea for him. It would be a rule of righteousness and justice over the entire world. And this is, this is the, uh, um, the outline of uh, 2 Samuel verses 1 through 7. As I said, the outline on the screen reminds us of the events of the first six chapters of 2 Samuel and how they led to the point where David was fully in charge of the entire nation. He was recognized by the people of Israel and by the nations around him as the legitimate king. He had established Jerusalem now as the capital, and he prepared to make it the spiritual and political center of the nation, and he did this first by having the Ark of the Covenant transported to the city. So as I said, the stage is now set for David to make Jerusalem the permanent location for the worship of the Lord God. And David was going to do this by building a temple. God did not agree, however, with David's plan. It was not that God was opposed to the idea of a temple per se, the idea of having a permanent place of worship, although the Lord did make it clear, as we will look in a few minutes, that he didn't need a temple as a place to be worshipped. God did not want David to build the temple because he had been a warrior and was responsible for the shedding of a great deal of blood. God did not want his house to be associated with war and destruction, but rather with peace and with righteousness and with justice. Now, as I've been going through the life of David, I've tried to make uh, as much practical application as I can from these stories. Today's passage, however, I, uh, the message is, is going to be, I will have a few practical applications, but really, this is an important lesson because it's talking about the, the role that David's throne and the nation of Israel is going to have in future events. And so this will be a little bit more of a teaching session, probably, than a... Uh, than a practical application, although I do have some of that as well. But we need to look at this. However, as we go through this, and you realize, really, when you think of the importance of recognizing God's program for Israel and God's program for the body of Christ, there's really nothing more practical than, than a practical or than, a, than an accurate understanding of how he is working with us today. If we're trying to apply principles that were meant for the nation of Israel into our life today, practically our Christian life is going to fall apart. We can't do those things that God was asking Israel to do, and we shouldn't be trying to do it. We should be looking to see what God is asking for us, asking of us as members of the body of Christ. And so in that sense, even though we'll be looking more as a, in a teaching capacity this week, or this, this Sunday, uh, it's still going to have very, very profound practical implications. Now, the first thing that we read in 2 Samuel 7.1 is that David was settled into his palace and the Lord had given him peace. David was finally done running from Saul. 
fighting the Philistines and the other Canaanites, and he was finally able to rest. This is a description of a man who is now entering another season of life. Up to this point, his agenda had been laid out for him. He didn't really have a choice. Saul was the one who was chasing him. The Philistines were after him. And, and so, in a sense, life was determining what he had to do. He needed to secure his position as the king of Israel. He needed to establish peace in the land. All of that had been accomplished. Now that one major goal was taken care of, and he was ready to move on to another stage of life which was for him, he thought, to build a house or a temple for the Lord. Now, in many ways, this is a picture that every one of us experiences in our life. We all go through some time when we have to be focused on the tasks of life. In other words, life creates the agenda for us. We need to work. We have to maintain our home. We have to care for our families. We have to do all the things that need to be done. We then reach those periods of transition, and, and they come in different stages in life. Graduation, leaving a job, the empty nest, retirement, whatever it is, these various stages come upon us. And these are often good opportunities. In this case, David had conquered, uh, he, Saul was gone, he had conquered the Philistines, the nation was at peace. He was at a point in his life where now he could sit back and reflect and say, what should I do now for the Lord? And I think we need to have a similar perspective as we walk through the various seasons of life. They're going to come upon us one way after another. And all of you are thinking, yeah, okay, I, you know, some of you it's the graduation, some of you it's the empty nest, some may be transitioning out of a job, some of you might be going to retirement, whatever it is. But when you face those natural transitions in life, it's a good time to sit back and to reflect. We need to examine each stage that we enter and try to see how the next one, the next part of our life, can be used to glorify God. Unfortunately, so often what we do is we think about, well, how, how am I going to be able to enjoy this next stage of life? How could I, you know, now, okay, now we've got the empty nest. How can I just take more vacations? Or how can I do more things that's going to just uh, make things good for me? and enjoy myself, or retirement. All you can think about now in, in retirement, how am I going to rest? How am I going to be able to take it easy? God is saying here, David, and keep in mind, David was a man who had, who had a heart after God, and he truly wanted to please God. Despite all of the mistakes he made, some of the big errors that, that, that came about in his life, he still had a desire to, to please God. And he had an idea. He had an idea, and he said, now that I have peace in the land, we can now build a permanent residence, a permanent place for the Lord to be worshipped. And so David, David had the rest from his enemies. God gave him this rest. So as we will see, David's period of rest, however, that particular season of his life, was only temporary. He would soon find himself back in the battle, but for the time being, he was in a position to do something for the Lord. Likewise, we need to recognize that all of these stages in life are temporary. There's only one that's going to last for a long time, and that's the one at the end. As we go through each one of these periods of our life, we need to reflect, as David was able to do, and say, now that I'm making these changes, now that things are a little bit different, how can I arrange things? How can I uh, put my energy into something that is going to be long-lasting, eternal? How can I invest in the work of the Lord? And so these are things we need to ask ourselves as we are going through these stages of life. If we determine that our plan is not what God desires, however, just as David had to, we should be flexible, be willing to change directions, but always keeping in mind what can we do to bring glory and honor to God. So David entered this new stage of life, and he determined that he felt it was appropriate that he should build a house for the Lord. And the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Now, the text does not specifically say that David intended to build the temple for the Lord, but it's very strongly implied in the comments uh, that Nathan makes in verse 3, in which he tells David to do as his heart wishes. Likewise, this is stated very clearly in 1 Chronicles 28, in which David specifically stated that he had heard that the Lord, the Lord had told him that he was not to build the temple. So by this statement here, it's implied, but it's, it's clear that David is saying, now I feel that we should build a temple for the Lord. David's suggestion seems to make sense. 
He looked around at his own situation. He was living in this beautiful palace of cedar, some expensive type of wood. He had this beautiful, magnificent house that was built just for him, this palace. So he, was, he then just asked himself, why should the Lord's place of worship just be a tent? He had had no permanent place. There had been no permanent place to worship the Lord up to that point for his holy presence to remain. David thought it was appropriate now that there was peace in the land, everything was settled, that there should be a permanent, uh, appropriate dwelling place for the presence of God and for the place where the, where the worship should take place. And this was a sincere request on David's part. But as we will see, his perspective was more about the outward and visible forms of worship than about true spiritual worship of God. So David was sincere in what he was doing. He was, he was asking himself, what can I do? I think, I, would, I think what we need now is to have a permanent place for God to be worshipped. And we'll come back to, to this nature of the worship in a, in a moment. And so even he went and he consulted the prophet of God. Now, we are introduced for the first time to this prophet named Nathan. He, this is the first time we see him showing up in the scriptures. And he's going to play a very important role a few chapters down the road here when we get to the story of Bathsheba. But here we have this prophet that was apparently a close companion of David named Nathan. He will play a large role as we, as he dis, uh, when we discuss David's uh, sin with Bathsheba. But Nathan's initial response was it seemed like David had a reasonable idea, and he encouraged him to do so. Go ahead, do what your heart desires. Go ahead and build this temple for the Lord. So up to this point, everything seemed like it should be full speed ahead. David was in a position of peace. He had stability in the nation. Jerusalem now was, was the capital. It was, it was uh, well fortified. It was, it was a good location. And so he looked around and he said, well, I've got this beautiful house. We should, we should do something for the Lord. He wanted to build a permanent structure that was suitable as a place of worship for the God of the universe, the one true living God. It seemed inappropriate that this great God should be worshipped only in a tent. And so he decided that he, they should build this temple. David presented the idea to God's prophet, and at first, first blush, it seemed like the right thing to do, and so he said, go ahead. So here... David's got the position, the situation, he's got the idea, he talks, he, gets, uh, he consults with the prophet of God, the prophet of God says, go ahead, sounds like a good idea, and, and that's the way you should go. However, later in the evening, Nathan the prophet received a direct revelation from God. The Lord spoke to him and specifically said that David would not be the one who would build a physical house for the worship of the Lord but that the Lord, however, would establish David's throne forever. And this is a perfect example of how our lives can go differently than we expect as well. That we can make all of these plans, we think we know what we want to do, but in reality, it's not what God wants. But rather, he has something better for us. He's always going to have a better idea that when he changes the direction, it's because he's got something better in store for us than what we may have planned ourselves. David had a big idea. He was going to build a temple for God. It seemed appropriate. He consulted the, the prophet. The prophet said, go ahead. But then God spoke through the prophet to David and said, no, this isn't what we're going to do. I have something better in store for you. Another biblical example, one that I'm very fond of, and I've used this example a number of times, of how God can overrule in our plans is with the Apostle Paul. He had these, these, this great idea, which again seemed appropriate. He was going to, uh, when he was writing the Ro to the Romans, and this was written from the city of Corinth, while he was in Corinth, he had a plan. He was going to go and he was going to finish the collection that was being made for all of the believers in Greece, bring that money, take it to Jerusalem. If you remember the Jerusalem saints, uh, they had sold all of their possessions in the early book of Acts. They were... They, uh, the kingdom did not come, the tribulation, and then the king did not, did not come as it was supposed to, and they were left penniless. They had no possessions, they had no land, all of that had been, had, had been lost. And so, De, uh, so Paul had, um, had the burden to care for the believers who were in Jerusalem, so he would take these collections. And so now he was on his last missionary journey, he was going around to the churches in Greece, collecting funds to help, uh, to help the, the believers in Jerusalem who were in such bad, bad shape. And he had this great plan. I'm going to get the money, 
Then I'm going to go to Jerusalem, give them uh, the, the, the funds that we've collected from Greece, encourage them, and then I'm going to move on to Rome, where I'm going to be able to encourage the believers there. He had never been to Rome. It's the greatest city in the empire, the most powerful place on earth at the time. And so he felt it was appropriate to go to the church in Rome that he had never visited and give them some words of encouragement on his way to Spain to reach the farthest end of the world at that time, the farthest part of the known world. So here we again, we read, however, in the book of Acts, we find that Paul's plans did not go as he had expected. He got to Jerusalem, and he was arrested. And we'll just look at this. I want to read this passage here. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So he's got, he's got, a, he's got it all planned out. He knows exactly what he's going to do, and all of it seems absolutely appropriate. Why wouldn't you want to take the gospel, um, first of all, help the believers in Jerusalem, visit the believers in Rome, and then take the gospel to the farthest ends of the earth? That was absolutely appropriate. There's no reason to think that that plan would have been outside of the will of God. However, we read now that God had different plans for him. He, he ended up in Jerusalem... And while he was there, he was arrested. And he was about to be executed, but Paul took advantage of his Roman citizenship and appealed his case to the emperor. So to do that, he had to travel to Rome. So from Jerusalem, or Caesarea, where he had been, held a prisoner, from there he set sail to Rome with some of his companions, but on the way, he was shipwrecked. And he ended up spending several months uh, on an island there, is it Crete, was that the island where he was? Uh, might have been, yeah. We'll have to look that one up. Okay, that's your challenge. It was a Crete or Malta where he, where he ended up shipwrecked. But anyway, he, they ended up shipwrecked. Eventually, he arrived in Rome, and there he was a prisoner under house arrest for two years. However, while he was a prisoner in that house in Rome, he wrote a letter to the church in Philippi in which he described how God took this situation and blessed it. And he says, says here, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains uh, are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So while Paul had a plan, God had a different idea. Now, there was nothing wrong, as I said, nothing wrong with Paul's plan to go to Spain. From a human perspective, it seemed quite reasonable. Paul knew that it was God's will for all of mankind to have an opportunity to hear the gospel. He had a desire, a burning desire, to spread the good news as far as possible. And for him, that would have been Spain. That would have been the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire. On the way, though, he was going to stop in Rome just to say hi and to offer some encouragement. However, as we see, by Paul becoming a Roman prisoner, it turned out to give him access to the closest and most powerful people, the people mo closest uh, to the most powerful person in the empire at that time. As you see, he had opportunity to share the gospel with those, as he says in uh, chapter 4, with those who are believers in Caesar's household. And that also, furthermore, those who were already believers became emboldened because they had seen the testimony and they see the example of the way Paul was willing to suffer as a prisoner for Christ. And so this is a perfect example of how we think our life should go in, in one direction. And again, he was not planning anything against the will of God. All of that was reasonable. It was all correct. It was all appropriate. But God had a different plan, a better plan. He was going to bring him as a prisoner, take him as a prisoner, in Rome, and there he had access to those who were the closest to the emperor. And, and as I was preparing for this, I was actually thinking of, uh, of our interns, the Sanders, because uh, we've, they've been with us now for almost a year, and we've been through a few different plans, haven't we, in this last several months? <laughs> and uh, we've try, been trying to figure out where God is leading them, directing them to serve him after this season of life. They're going through that exact 
transition in the next, in the next few weeks. And when we have our, our commissioning service, that will be the next stage of their life. And they're going to be looking to see where God is directing them. We talked about a number of different options over the last several months. God is at the moment leading them to Malaysia. But you know what? That may not be where they end up. That may not be God's final plan, just as it wasn't for Paul. Paul saw himself in Spain. God saw him sitting in a prison uh, in, a, as, in house arrest in Rome. And there he had access to the guards who actually had access to the emperor. And they were able to share the gospel with them and have a greater influence, perhaps, than even if he had gotten all the way to Spain. And so we see God has a way of taking the plans of life and making them conform to his will, working things out all for our benefit. We know that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Then we also see that God did not reject the concept of having a temple built for him as the place where his people would come to worship. He simply told Nathan that David was not going to be the one who was going to build the temple. It was going to be one of David's offsprings who was going to build a house for the Lord. And as we find out later, God takes this temple, he takes the idea of the temple and makes it a central part of his plans for the rest of the, of, of the history of Israel and into the future. The temple is a very integral part of God's eternal plan for, for Israel. And much of the future events that are described in the Old Testament prophets and in the book of Revelation focus around this temple. This is the same pattern that God used with, with the idea of a king in Israel. Originally, Israel was a pure theocracy. It had no single ruler. Israel, however, asked for a king, and God granted them their request, with the condition, however, that the king would always acknowledge that the Lord, God, is the true ruler in the nation. God, however, then took the monarchy in Israel and made it the model for his future messianic kingdom which would, in, which, uh, in which the Messiah would rule over Israel and all of the nations from Jerusalem. So the temple, the, the, the monarchy, both of these ideas, uh, these were, were human suggestions, so to speak. Not that you know, God, of course, is in control of everything, but it was the Israelites who asked for a king. And uh, God granted them that request, and then he took that model and he turned it into, uh, to use it for his own glory. The same thing is true of the temple. This was David's idea to suggest a temple. God didn't need a temple. He was perfectly satisfied in the tent. But then God took that idea and he transforms it and uses it for his ultimate purposes. The Lord, however, pointed out to Nathan that he, the Lord, had never asked to have a permanent structure built for him. He reminded Nathan that since the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, that he had simply traveled with them in the tent and the tabernacle, and that was really good enough. And it reminds us that God does not need elaborate and extravagant facilities in order to be worshipped. Now, as I said, God did not oppose the idea of the temple. In fact, he took it, he embraced it, and, uh, and he used it and intends to use it. However, it's not the place that was important to him, but it was the attitude of the worshipers. In Ezekiel, there is this scene in which the glory of the Lord departs from the temple. Israel was in disobedience and living outside of the will of God. They had this beautiful building, they had the facility, but the presence of, the God, the presence of God was gone. Now, in reality, the reality of God's omnipresence is described very clearly in John chapter 4, where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well. She said to Jesus that the Jews claimed that God had to be worshipped at the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus told her that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must do so in, the, in spirit and in truth. And this was a statement made while the temple was still standing and while the ordinances of worship were still in place. Jesus is not nullifying the importance of the temple worship. He is simply explaining that true worship can take place anywhere. The sacrifices still needed to be done at the temple when Jesus was saying this. That was God's requirement. But the true worshiper of God is going to do so with a heart that is not restricted to any single location. And likewise, you know, you don't, we don't need anything extravagant or anything uh, elaborate or all of the fancy trappings in order to worship God. We can worship God anywhere and in any place. 
uh, it's um, Sue and I, when we've taken our vacations and gone to Europe, we like to go to the, the big cathedrals in the major cities. They're magnificent works of art and, and incredible, uh, it's incredible architecture. Now, ostensibly, those were built for the glory of God. But I wonder sometimes if they really weren't just built for the glory of man. What can we do? How, how fancy can we make it? And it's true, they are, they are absolutely beautiful. But what really is the motivation? And the other question is, just as the temple was standing there with all its beauty and all of its magnificence, but in Ezekiel, the, the presence of the Lord removed, was removed from there, it was nothing but a hollow shell. The same can be true of any church building. This is not holy because it's been sanctified in some special way. This is holy. What makes this church holy, a holy place, is because those who are congregating here have within themselves the presence of God's Holy Spirit. That's what makes this a holy place. When you leave, when everybody goes, this is just going to be another building. It's going to be another empty building. It's not like there's something special that's hanging around here. It's not that at all. God is he's everywhere, and he is in with, within each and every one of you. And you are the ones, as you come here to worship God in spirit and in truth, you are the ones then who make this a holy place. Then we find out that David was not the one who was going to build the temple. We went over this uh, in previous weeks. I just want to remind you of it. It was, again, because he had been a man of war. God is a God of peace, and he wanted the temple to be built during a time of peace and prosperity in Israel. He didn't want it associated with war and strife or with an individual who was associated with war and strife. And so David was the one, was not the one chosen to actually build the temple. And of course, these passages here uh, in 1 Chronicles 28, where David says, but God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and have shed blood. And also Solomon talking about David, said, You know how my father David could not build a house in the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which he fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. So the climax of this entire first seven chapters of 2 Samuel is found in 2 Samuel chapter, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 17. This passage is often called the Davidic Covenant. God told David that he would not be the one who would build the house for the Lord, but that, um, but that in fact, uh, he, God had something much greater. He was not going to build the house for the Lord, but, but the Lord was going to build a house for him. He was going to build a dynasty that would last forever. Now, there's a... Um, there's a good series of articles. This particular passage here could go, we could go into great detail, but I would encourage you if you want to get a better uh, sense about the, the Davidic covenant, uh, this website here, J.A. Show John Ankerberg, he has a series of four articles on his website that uh, provides the biblical evidence to prove the literal fulfillment of the promises that God gave to David, or that they are going to be fulfilled, why we should understand them to be literal, uh, fulfilled literally in a, um, in a Davidic dynasty that is going to rule over the earth in the future. But uh, So if you, if you want to, to get a little bit better information about this, more detail, a lot of scripture, this, these passages are filled with scripture passages, you can go to that website and uh, just search, go into the little search box and search Davidic Covenant. But I would encourage you to, to take some time to do that. But here we have the passage that's known as the Davidic Covenant. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up for your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. This is to be understood as a literal promise given to David that his dynasty would rule over Israel for eternity. Now many have read this prophecy and have asked if it actually refers to Solomon. Because Solomon, David's son, was the one who 
did build the first temple. He was the king who followed David, and he was the one who actually was able to build a temple. And to me, this seems to be an example, a perfect example of, of prophecy that has both short-term and long-term fulfillment. That yes, in one sense, Solomon is a fulfillment of this prophecy, but he is not the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy for a number of reasons. First of all, Solomon's dynasty or Solomon's uh, throne did not last forever. It was not eternal. And likewise, um, we, we will see that there are passages, that there are, there are phrases in here that specifically are identified as having referred to Jesus Christ. But this is the origin of the Davidic dynasty, and this is one of the great mountain peaks of biblical revelation. It's, it's one of the most significant and important passages in Scripture. Here, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. Now, we also know that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment. He's identified in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. He is the one of whom Jesus said, uh, I, will be, uh, I will be a father to him, and he shall be my son. If you look at the passage back in 2 Samuel, that's one of the things that's said about him. There's a quote here from Psalm chapter 2 and from 2 Samuel chapter 7 in Hebrews. Uh, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be my son. That comes directly out of 2 Samuel. Now last week we mentioned that many Christians today do not believe that this promise will be fulfilled literally. That somehow when God said that there would be one who would come and rule from David's throne and his reign would be forever, he didn't really mean the throne of David, but some kind of gen- general rule or reign over the earth, some kind of general idea, general throne, representing God's eternal reign, and that the Messiah would not reign specifically over Israel as a discernible and identifiable nation. Now, ironically, virtually all believers, regardless of how they view the role of Israel in the end times, they do see the literal fulfillment of the prophecies of the Messiah being a descendant of David in his first coming and being literally fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ and and in his uh, ministry and life. Yet there are many in the church who will then go on to say that while, while the first coming might be literal, the first coming of the Messiah was literal, and literally fulfilled, those prophecies of the second coming have been fundamentally altered, and they're really they're all to be understood symbolically. They represent, Israel represents the body of Christ, and the throne is a throne in heaven, not a throne on earth. Zion is not really here uh, uh, in, in Jerusalem, but it's, but it's representing uh, something in the in generic in the heavenlies. And so they, they would understand, but all of them will say, yes, that the Messiah was going to be a descendant, a literal descendant of David. He would be born in uh, in Bethlehem. All of those prophecies they understand in the first fulfillment, the uh, the first coming as being literally fulfilled. But then for some reason, God changed his mind in the second coming and all of these things become symbolic. Obviously, that's inconsistent thinking. Um, And this is one reason, well, in fact, last week, Rex came up to me after the sermon. I was commenting about, again, how some do not believe that Jerusalem, the promises about Jerusalem being the, the final capital for the Messiah's kingdom, will be literally fulfilled. And he said to me, Rex said to me, if God doesn't intend to keep his promises to Israel, why should we expect him to keep his promises to us? And, of course, that is exactly right. It is inconsistent to think that all the promises of the first coming should be understood literally, but those of the second should all be allegorical or figurative. Uh, it's, It's an inconsistent way of thinking. And this is one reason why it is important to understand the Bible dispensationally. It has to do with the faithfulness of God to keep his word. Will he, in fact, fulfill the promises that he made to his people or not? If he, is, if he is changing the definition of his words and changing the, the, the definition of what seems very clear to everybody else right in the middle of the game, how do we know he's not going to do the same to us? How do we know that he's going to be consistent in his fulfillment of all of his promises? Clearly, we can see that if God does not intend to fulfill his promises to Israel, there are going to be millions of Old Testament believers who are going to be very surprised in eternity because they are clearly understood all of these promises that were given about the future kingdom in a literal sense. That they they believed that uh, the things that that Jesus taught in his earthly ministry, the things that the Old Testament prophets 
taught they expected that God will establish a literal kingdom of justice and righteousness on earth, that that kingdom would be centered in Jerusalem, that the king would be the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, that he would sit on the royal throne of King David, that the reign would be over all the earth, but that Israel would be preeminent and have a role as a nation of priests and a holy people. In fact, the very last question asked of the, the apostles before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven was this very thing. Therefore, when they had come together, and at, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom uh, to Israel? So we see that they were expecting this literal fulfillment. They had all of that in mind. And so he, and Jesus did not say to them, no, 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 don't you get it? All of this is figurative. This isn't really Israel. This is, this is going to be this new body of Christ thing that, uh, that I was telling you about, which he wasn't telling them about. But anyway, the point being, they understood very clearly what, what this was to be. And likewise, no one is going to be more surprised if God was changing the, the meaning of these words. No one is going to be more surprised than David himself. Because look what David says later in the chapter as he is offering a prayer to God. Now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant, concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. Let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let, let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant David. I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. Clearly, in David's mind, he foresaw the fulfillment of God's promises as a literal rule over Israel. David was looking for Israel to be the center of God's program for the future. And then we see the picture of the fulfillment of this. Likewise, a literal fulfillment here is pictured in Revelation chapter 20. And they, this is uh, after the, the dead had been raised, after the seven years' tribulation. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. But this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Now that phrase, priests of God and of Christ, that's code for Israel because they will be a nation of priests. That's, that's one of the <clears throat> promises that, uh, that Moses gave way back in the, in the Pentateuch. They would be a nation of priests. And so as they would rule with him, it's talking about Israel ruling over the nations with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the significance of this, the reason that this is important, is that it teaches us about the faithfulness of God the faithfulness of him to fulfill his promises, that God will do what he says he will do. However, there's another lesson that's highlighted here, and this is that it's important to make a clear distinction between the future promises that the Lord has for the nation of Israel and the work that he is doing today through the body of Christ. If nothing else is clear, we see that the future kingdom is focused on Israel, the descendant of David on his throne, and righteousness going forth to all the earth, but based from Jerusalem. Today, however, there is no distinction between the Jew and the Gentile. Our hope is in the heavens, where we will be with him forever. It's very important that we make this distinction. We recognize that God is going to fulfill his will for us and the will that he has revealed for the nation of Israel. So David had reached a transition period in his life. He was not in a position to do things that uh, he had been able, to, or he was in a position to do things he had not been able to do before. He was at peace, everything was settled, and, um, and he had uh, established Jerusalem now as the capital for Israel. He was, he was ruling all over Israel. He was now able to go on to another stage of life. He wanted to do something to honor God, and he believed sincerely that it was to build a permanent place for the worship of the Lord God. God, however, did not need that temple in which to be worshipped. However, he allowed it to happen, but David was not the one to do it. The first earthly physical temple was built by Solomon, but a much greater plan was in God's mind that it would be through David's rule and through his dynasty that would come the Messiah, the great ruler over all the earth. So God had a plan that was much greater than what David was able to imagine in his mind. 
So from among David's descendants would come one who would rule over all of Israel and the nations from David's throne. It would be a perfect rule of righteousness and justice. It will be a reign, the reign of Jesus Christ over all the earth, and it will be literally fulfilled at the second coming of the Lord when he comes to earth. God is faithful to do what he says he will do. He was faithful in bringing the Lord Jesus Christ first to come. He fulfilled all of those promises literally. All of the promises about the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ being born in Bethlehem, uh, of, of the ministry that he did, of the miracles that he performed, uh, of his death and resurrection, all of those were understood and were, in fact, fulfilled literally. Why should we think that he is not going to literally fulfill the rest of them? It just doesn't make sense that he changed and switched everything that went, was going to be literal in one sense, now simply becomes figurative and, 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 and metaphorical and all of these uh, ideas that, that uh, others have come up with. We should understand that God gave liber literal promises, he will fulfill literal promises. And likewise, he has given literal promises to us. And they are abundant. We can talk about the fact that we are secure in Christ, the fact that we are, uh, that we are his... Um, you know, members of his body, that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. And the, the list of promises goes on and on and on. And that we, someday, will be caught up to be with him in the air. And this is the promise that will, once again, be literally fulfilled. For Israel, he will come down to earth, and he will reign for them at Jerusalem. We, however, are anticipating that catching up in the air, what we typically call the rapture. And if he promised it to us, we know he will be faithful to fulfill it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you have given us literal